Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yes. All right. Okay. So. We're on. Are we recording? We are recording. We are live. All right. Okay. Do you want to do like a podcast intro? Because it's your podcast. No, nah, I'll do one. Like, I'll record it afterwards. i got to remember talking to the microphone. All right. So, um, so yeah, we're talking tonight uh, inspired by Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris. And so, we have Patrick Cool arguing for the atheist position and i don't know what i'm arguing for because i are you arguing that there is a god are you gonna go that far oh there is a god but i don't i don't really feel the need to to argue for it Mm. like um i'm not really bothered if you do or don't believe so to speak instead of doing Atheist versus whatever. Whatever. Okay. How about I just try and outline what I think Peterson's view is? Yeah, just just bring the mic a little bit further away. Oh, just like that? Out. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, I'll outline what I think Peterson's position is. Oh, and then you want me to do Sam Harris? Yeah, or well, you can try, yeah. Yeah, I'll cool. do that. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So, uh, a, bit of, a bit hard to know where to start with it. So, I think they've got... <laughs> Sorry. I'll be mature. <laughs> I think they've got a common ground in that they both they both think that you need to have a starting point, which is uh, good and bad. Um, you need to know it, defi- define roughly where evil lies. But I don't think they agree on exactly their definitions. But they've both got that. They agree that you need an up and a down. So that sort of gives them a starting point. Agreed. Um. Uh, oh. oh, fuck me! I'll edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to think of where to start with it. So, okay, oh, fuck it. I'll just I'll just go all in. Go so, all in. So Peterson's idea of God. So, I I think yeah uh, I think Peterson's actually, well, an atheist would probably describe him as as being agnostic because I don't think you could pin Peterson down to say, okay, I believe in one or another God, like a Christian God or a um, Hindu God or anything like that. But he's got this concept of a God. And basically that God is, what he's done is he's looked through a bunch of religions, a bunch of philosophy, a bunch of psychology and he's found the common archetype stories that run across all of those religions and schools of thought. And so basically he's come out of that with a bunch of uh, axioms, I think. So his idea of an archetypal story is that they are evolved ideas in the collective unconscious So, uh, similar to an animal instinct, you've got them hardwired into you. And so, basically, the collective unconscious is just this ongoing um, uh, space that we all share in our collective thoughts. And there's these themes that run through that over the history of humans. And he basically brings um, evolution into it with the idea that uh, ideas that would be promote survival have lasted and are common across different cultures. Um, and then the idea is that the bad ideas have sl- slowly um, died off. The, the atheist always wanting to argue back to the Bible is trying to, trying to bring a theist you know, to be accountable for everything written in the Bible. I think Peterson, because because like if you talk to most Christians now, mm. and you could go through the Bible and find a bunch of stuff that, um, you know, they're they're bad moral codes to live by, simple rules and whatnot. But you don't know many beer. No, just if you could pass me a pen, and and probably that notebook as well. Um. So, cheers, Cobb. Uh, so, most uh, 
modern Christians have already discarded with the bad ideas in the Bible, and they only really live on the uh, live by the the ones that have lasted and the ones that uh, correlate with you know the culture that they live in and um, and also like the their own rational inquiry into it. But they're not willing to re- reject the entire Bible based on not agreeing with some parts of it. And possibly quite a few of them won't acknowledge the fact that there are things in the Bible that they don't agree with. They'll just say that, oh, I interpret them in different ways. Um, so, Mate, this is a long opening statement. Keep going, <laughs> keep going. Uh, so, yeah, I'll try and simplify it. So it's basically... Oh yeah, this this is this was my original point. So you've got you've got a belief structure. A rigid belief structure is basically an ideology or dogma. So that's a really really rigid um, form of belief st- structure. Which for Peterson he always goes on that this happens in a totalitarian state where you're not allowed free inquiry and you know freedom to question your beliefs. You're just told what to believe and. And you stick to that. So too much rigidity in your belief structure is bad. But if you go too far the other way, you end up with nihilism where you doubt the meaning of everything and and nothing has meaning to you and then you're, you're nihilistic and you have no purpose and you get depressed and that leaves, leads to a terrible life. So Peterson's basically saying that religion provides a good solid belief structure of evolved uh, archetypes these archetypes are all passed on through stories uh, and that and that's how it, the knowledge gets passed through intergenerationally and then and the, and that that's a good uh, system of beliefs to start on and and he acknowledges that in that there's natural evolution so there he acknowledges that a lot of these archetypals or, or not even the arch, archetypical stories but say the uh, just some of the what do they call I can't think of the word, but just ideas presented in the Bible. Some of them are going to go out of date when we work out later on that they're not the best way to live. Um, that'll do for now. Okay. So, I guess I just want to open up by saying Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson debating the idea of God is... It's unusual in terms of these debates because usually what happens is you'll get a rigid atheist who is dogmatic that science will explain everything and then he'll be debating someone who is a christian apologist so he's defending the traditional christian faith and he'll be from some particular denomination but it's obvious he's a christian now it's not obvious if what is if jordan peterson is christian or not it's a subject of some debate um I, i would argue that he is and just from some of the comments that he's made online and stuff. He is a Christian or he is religious? I would go so far as to say he is a Christian. And if you sort of unpack the, the biblical stories, he's what he's doing is he's arguing for the fact that these stories are psychologically true. And he, he's very careful to say, I'm not dealing with them on a theological level. Because that's not my area of expertise. And so he's what he's saying, it's honest because he's a psychologist, he's not a theologian. But there's a sense where when you talk about him in this much detail, you are dealing with theological matters. So I think he kind of is. And he, he says a number of times that I act as if there is a God. And when you think about that statement, coming from someone else, you think, oh, okay, they're using it as a tool to guide their moral choices. But in the Peterson context, when he says, I act as if there is a God, he's a committed, uh, he's a psychologist, and a lot of his psychological ideas are formed by Carl Jung and other psychoanalysts. And one of the things about psychoanalytic theory is that there's this idea that um, we're, we're strangers to ourselves in a sense. And we don't really understand. And and he, he even says this. Don't listen to what people say they believe. Look at how they act. And then you'll really know what they believe. So when he says, I act as if there is a God, he's kind of saying, well, if you look at my actions, then you'll know what I believe. 
but he's saying it in a way. Right. Which, yeah. Um, but, and also Sam Harris, he, he does say he's an atheist, but if you read his book, Waking Up, he's like, he's espousing meditation, which has always been found in religious traditions. And also if you look at the symbolism and Peterson never mentions this, but I wish he would like on the cover of the Waking Up book, there's a picture of the sun and it's a gold embossed sun. It's right. like the sun rising. And if you look at like religious symbolism and the sun, the sun, well, it, it was a god. They, the Egyptians worshipped it. But it, it's always emblemized the, um, I don't know, this idea of consciousness rising and, and clarity and truth. And, and there's this idea that the sun is the light and that's how we see clearly. And that's all there. And the book is called Waking Up. So it's this idea of waking up from a lower state of being to a higher state of being. So they don't really, neither of the two thinkers easily fall into the Christian atheist camp. Um, the other point that I wanted to make, just on what you said, and this is part of part of the the problem with the way Sam Harris approaches it, is he'll, he'll pick a point in the Bible or the Quran. It'll be something like, there's there's a story in the Bible where Abraham tells no God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, and then excuse me, and then Harris says, "Oh well, this is obviously a primitive superstitious belief. How could anyone believe in a God that tells tells you to sacrifice your own son?" But like he's not looking at the interpretations and there are a lot of different interpretations because when you look at the Bible, it's not like, it's not a book of instructions. It's not even a book. The Bible itself is, there's 66 books in the Bible. So it's actually, it's more accurate to think of the Bible as a a collection of books in one volume. It, it's a library, it, it's a library of like, I don't know, maybe a thousand or two thousand years of religious thought. And so to take out one verse or one command and say, well, and he seems to be saying either you accept this is literally true or you're just picking and choosing and you're using your 21st century system of ethics like to to, to justify your position. Um, but like, yeah, it's not a monolithic text. But, um, so do you think a particular story like that Christianity could do away with it? No, because like that is an essential story if you understand it in context. If you want to take a strict literalist interpretation, that story will will mess with your head. Because then God does seem to be a monster. But if you can step back and think what is this story telling us about the relationship between humans and the divine? And and if you think about the Bible as a progr- in Petersonian terms as a progressive evolutionary uh, journey from lower forms of consciousness to higher forms and the refinement of morality and ethics, that story makes sense because human sacrifice. Um, it's almost a universal in really primitive ancient religions. And so at the time of that story, so it's set, I think Abraham was thought to have lived, if he was a real figure, but I'm not saying he is. So you're looking at something that happened in the Middle East three or 4,000 years ago. I don't know. At the time, most of the religions in the Middle East were sacrificing their children to the gods. Um, and so... What happens in the story is God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son. as And, and it's, it's this really old, primitive, dark idea that you need to sacrifice something valuable to the gods to appease them. But then Abraham gets to the top of the mountain and God miraculously gives him a sheep and says, no, I want you to sacrifice the sheep instead. And then... 
he sacrifices the sheep and God seems to be pleased with him. Now, if you just look at it literally, you think, well, why would God want him to sacrifice his son? God's a monster. But if you look at, if you step back from the context and, and think, okay, what the ancient Israelites were doing was saying, our God is not murderous. He's not barbaric. He doesn't want us to sacrifice our children. We can sacrifice a sheep instead. It's a progression from like a lower, darker, more primitive understanding of our relationship to the infinite to something more humane. And you see that evolve throughout the Bible. Um, so, but do you think that that is the mainstream teaching of that story in Christian churches? Or is, because I get this sense that Peterson is really, really good at interpreting these stories yes, yes. and has done his research. Um, so if you're going to the church of Jordan Peterson, I would be a lot easier with, you know, with yeah, a disciple yeah. of his, but is that the typical Christian interpretation? Yeah, so most... Or, or, or maybe there's not... Like my experience in a church is they'll tell you the story and not give you any help interpreting it. It'll be sort of, it's up to you to interpret it in mm, your own way. Mm. Which doesn't yeah. seem very useful. No, I, I, I totally agree with you. And um, like the whole, this whole understanding that the Bible is literally true, it, it tripped me up for years. And it's only through discovering Jordan Peterson and the affiliated thinkers on YouTube, guys like Paul Van Der Klee and Jonathan Peugeot. I mean, they're explicitly Christian, but they're bringing... They're talking about Peterson and they're also understanding the Bible and these universals of story and archetypes from a symbolic sense. And now that I'm able to understand that you can read the Bible and you can understand life through symbolism and I'm kind of out of this literalist trap, the Bible actually makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a point that... Harris was making. Well, he doesn't quite get there and I think he should. No, he comes pretty close. I might not be okay. following the same thing, but um, it seems that... So, I don't think Peterson supports a dogmatic view of Christianity. No. He thinks that it needs to continue to evolve um, yeah. with the times. Uh, and so, a good a good criticism then of Christianity, say, would be, well, they're not doing a very good job of... Um, evolving it, there's some people. There's some oh, away. There's some people that are doing a really good job of it, um, but maybe the the majority of the the church or the the major institutions are trying to keep it in that dogmatic ideological sort of um, space. Yeah, and I guess my you have to sort of look at the history of Christian thought to 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 understand what's going on. So this sort of goes back 150, 200 years ago. And um, so you were looking at things like uh, in the 1850s, there were these German scholars and they were doing research. Uh, I think I think it was called higher criticism. I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll have a Cooper's. Cheers, man. Um, and so they were questioning, you know, is the Bible literally true? And they were starting to study archaeology in the Middle East and they were realizing, oh, hang on, these events don't quite match up with, uh, with what we're finding. And then, so you had archaeology and literary criticism of the Bible and they were starting to realize that this is a set of religious stories and perhaps they're not 100% literally true. And then roughly the same time, you had all the debates about evolution and Charles Darwin and other scientists, and they were finding out that there's a fossil record and it seems to be that God didn't speak the world into existence. Perhaps life evolved over a very long time. And so in reaction, and also you had the emergence of the scientific worldview where it was thinking rationally, and using reason, that was seen as the highest value. And anything that didn't make sense in a rational, closed system um, 
was was seen as irrational and therefore less valid and probably less true. And in reaction to that, um, a lot of Christians, and we're still living with the aftermath of this today, said that they were fundamentalists. And they said, oh, okay, every word in the Bible is literally true. So, so they sort of um, retreated... It was a reaction. ...back into a more fundamental interpretation. Is that, yes, yeah, yeah. and, and it, it was defensive. And, and so I think what, what they were thinking is, well, it, it was sort of like the, the scientific establishment made this move. Okay, the Bible's not literally true. Perhaps God didn't create the world 6,000 years ago. And their reaction was to say, no, you're wrong. And they've retreated and they've said, no, but our book's literally true. And, and, you, and so a lot of the attacks of atheists are on this literal interpretation of Christianity. But that hasn't been the mainstream view for like most of Christian history. Yeah, I think that's, that's a real low-hanging fruit yeah. type of um, argument against and so, religion. When I watch Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson go out, Sam Harris will say something like, "Well, the Bible tells you you should stone, yeah, yeah. you should stone an adulteress." He, he can't help but reach yeah. for a few, just every now and then. There, yeah, I notice the same thing. Yeah, and it, like, but, but that's cause that's his like that's his shtick or whatever they call it. You know, like well, that's his bread and butter. So I think he, I think the conversation was really good, mm. but he he just can't help but blurting those things out uh, and he probably i reckon if he watched the debate afterwards he would think oh. oh, that wasn't quite necessary you know that that just derailed things. well no no it, it's not that simple because harris makes the point that okay well if if you're not gonna obey all of the commandments then you're picking and choosing so you're using your own uh intuition and your own 21st humanistic understanding of morality to decide what parts of the bible you do and don't believe and so you're not treating it as a holy book like christians do whereas like a lot of christians do believe that uh somehow the bible is inspired but it's not all literally true so let me this i'll continue on with my theory of what jordan peterson thinks yeah okay so I think that he believes that these um, archetypal stories that flow on through millennia mm. uh, are constantly evolving and that uh, in a good environment, they would now evolve in such a way or our interpretation of them in, would evolve in such a way that they would come to align with modern facts. So like the things that we know are good from factual inquiry. Mm. scientific inquiry Mm. but i was thinking about it uh yesterday and like i was thinking about in terms of food right so you've got rules like halal and haram and kosher so yeah yeah yeah. so you could look at that as a religious attempt to basically um set some rules on what are uh what are some rules about what i eat that will lead to me basically surviving and they're fairly rudimentary attempts at that but you could you could sort of look at them as a uh, a rudimentary attempt at you know food health and safety right but you know coming from uh, a place of ignorance and so the idea is that i think peterson thinks that those ideas will evolve with our current understanding but when you think about it modern understanding of say like germ science and food health and safety hasn't hasn't even been around what like 100 years really as a science so it hasn't had time to do any evolution so i'm sort of getting this idea in my head that given time a lot of say like halal will slowly just come into line to correlate with things that we now know are true about what is good and bad to eat yeah, I guess I want to go back to my my initial point about the Bible being a collection of books, and a lot of those. Do you do you think they're all written by humans? There's no doubt they're written by humans, yeah. but like uh, from their own thoughts, or is it they're, they're, well, they're the hand of God? No, it? okay, let's unpack that from their own thoughts. Like, just think about that statement. Um, and so one of the things that one of the points that Peterson makes, and, and this this might seem a little esoteric, a little out there, but 
just bear with me. So one of the things that Peterson mentions more than once is like where do thoughts come from? Like when you when you come up with a new idea or we a new don't way know. Of, there we go. And so like maybe ancient people said, you know, the Lord spoke to me. Maybe a modern person would say, I felt inspired, but what has inspired me? Like we don't really understand where our thoughts come from. Are they coming from inside us? Like it's it, it sort of raises a whole lot of questions about consciousness itself. Um, yeah, well, you could definitely. I can definitely see how you could interpret it as God spoke to me, as in the the God that Peterson sort mm. of describes, which is uh, I can't I can't think of his definition, but it's basically following these archetypal stories and yeah. these um, heuristics that have been passed on. So you've got these things programmed into your unconscious mind. So you might sit down and write and you're writing again all these archetypal stories and all these heuristic type stories. Mm. And so by his definition, that is coming from God. Yeah, like that's one interpretation. But also Peterson does talk about, uh, I think in lecture seven of the biblical series, he talks about, I think that lecture is titled The Phenomenology of the Divine. And most of the lecture he spends talking about the shamanic tradition and how psychedelics have played their part in oh, yeah. the evolution of human spirituality. And it's an interesting idea because... Um, and so, yeah, you could argue that maybe it's coming from the collective unconscious or like the collective wisdom of humanity and somehow it's coming to you. But then there is this idea with psychedelics and people like... Okay, we don't have hard data. Like, it's not like someone takes a psychedelic and, and we know what's happening. Well, we do know what's happening in the brain, but when they report, okay, I was in the jungle and I, I saw the spirit of the earth or, or, or they, had, they went on some sh- shamanic journey. Like, you're getting multiple reports across thousands of years from people from all different cultures claiming to have an experience of the divine. And so, when... When someone in the Bible sort of... And, and this is a bit of a turning point for me because I actually read a book called... Uh, it's by Michael Pollan. It's called uh, something... It's called How to Change Your Mind, The Emerging Science of Psychedelics. And um, it, it really made me think about the nature of consciousness itself. Um, and, 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 and I think the fundamental issue... Like and the difference between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson, and perhaps between me and you, but I'm speculating a little bit, is whether you think the universe or human experience is a closed system. Like, do you think that it's just we just have human beings talking to each other, interacting with the world and the environment, and somehow the interplay of that that produces a world of experience, or do you think that there could be, or, or the or the Earth, the universe is an open system? And it can be influenced from outside. The and, first one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> and that's what, that's what I thought. But yeah. but like when you think about um, psychedelics, and like I'm I'm agreeing. It's we don't have hard proof, but you've got all these people from all these different cultures from thousands of years who are coming back and saying I had some sort of encounter with the supernatural, with being itself. Right, so there's a shared experience there. There's a shared experience. Even though experience. these people might not have had any interaction with one another. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it, it it makes you wonder. Yeah. It makes you wonder. And because from a 21st, perspe- 21st century perspective, and we've, we've sort of been indoctrinated into this idea, and I'm not... I'm not anti-science, I'm not going to go all Eddie Bravo, but we have been schooled <laughs> in this idea that um, we live in a closed system and the idea that God or being or something could come into our universe from another place, like it, it, it's, it's viewed as intellectually um, backwards or superstitious, but why? Like it's just another philosophy, so to speak. Mm, yeah, I think so. Uh, <clears throat> and and like, I'll just say one more thing and then I'll let you go. So, um, it, honestly, read this book. It's the best book I read this year. 
So there's the a cha- psychedelic one. Yeah, yeah. How to yeah, change your mind by I've Michael Pollan. Heard it. Reference. Yeah, he d- he did the podcast rounds a few months ago, and that's how I found out about it. Right. Um. So they've been doing all these experiments on people with LSD, and what they found, and so what they've been doing is giving people large doses of LSD and putting them in a brain scanning machine and seeing what happens. Oh yeah. Yeah, and so what happens is you give someone LSD, they go into a brain scanning machine, I think an fMRI machine, and um, an area of their brain called the default mode network turns off. Now, the default mode network is a network in the brain and it's a collection of regions which are linked. And when you're sitting in a car, when you're doing nothing, and when you start ruminating, that's the default mode network. And it's generally thoughts about yourself, your life, your life story. It's the ego. And so it's things like, oh, that guy said this to me. And, oh, yeah. Oh, I've got to call my mom. And, oh, what am I going to cook for dinner? It's, every, it's the story, the history of your life. And this is just going in your brain all the time. And uh, the ego is necessary, but it can become a trap, a prison. It can sort of limit your understanding. Now... There's three different groups of people who don't have the default mode network running. People on psychedelic drugs, because uh, the psychedelics plug into the serotonergic pathways. So somehow you get this massive connection and the default mode network turns off. So people on psychedelics, and this is why, and I think this is why they have these experiences of like life and connectedness and oneness with nature, oneness with the other. Because their sense of self is literally like the brain network that is generating the sense of self, the sense of life story is turned off. So you turn it off and you get a glimpse at what it looks like. To of, not, of to being not be, the self of consciousness. Yeah, not looking through that um, lens of self. Constantly. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So that's the first group. The second group who they've studied are advanced Buddhist meditators. Okay. And think what they're trying to do. What, the, the brain scans are similar? They're the same. Really? Like when they're in a deep meditative state. Huh. And so what they're doing is... Because is, there's obviously this Buddhist doctrine of the extinguishing of the self or nirvana. And, and they're actually consciously... Well, through, through the meditative practices, they're trying to dial down and ultimately turn off this constant repetitive life story and just experience experience itself like right they want to have an unmediated experience of reality and they're actually doing that and then the third group is children under the age of eight when they're imagine imagining or like daydreaming no just in general Uh uh-huh i think it's like six or seven or eight something around right because they haven't developed a strong sense of self yet they haven't really got a strong ego they've got the beginnings of that's really interesting but it's not integrated so to speak and so, and, and and when you look at young children, they report all the time. They had this imaginary friend and like the boundaries between the real and the unreal aren't quite as clearly defined. And like, uh, this is not proof of anything, but I'm, I, I guess I'm almost landing on Sam Harris's side where I'm saying you can have a profound experience that is totally different from the 21st century rational intellectual reasonable life and it's it yeah maybe you can marry the two here somewhere because <clears throat> so say these people are having this the same or similar experiences and you know they might be from completely different cultures and it, it's a shared experience world worldwide across all different cultures right yeah so peterson's interpretation of that is that that would be <clears throat> a result of this sort of he calls it an a priori um, structure structure yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. so it's basically <clears throat> hard programmed into your unconscious mind right well, and, and okay. so it's a, L- everyone's going to have that sh- same experience right not exactly the same but so you, by your like biological uh makeup of a human because mm-hmm. we're, we're all extremely similar there are going to be correlations between how we interpret the world. doesn't matter where you come from, right? And so, <coughs> uh, 
this is his idea of these um, common experiences that we're, that we're all going to have. And uh, so... Yeah, no, no. So I think you're so saying like, something like... I get this like whole thing in my head and I'm like, okay, I got it. <laughs> I got it. And then I get into it and then uh, I just... I can't get to the end of it. So, well, uh, I think you're saying something along the lines of we, we have these shared uh, shared experiences over, over millennia, over tens of thousands of years. And... Um, and, and and that's why there are similarities and, and cross cultural similarities between stories and like the reasons why myths are structured the same. And and Peterson's understanding seems to be that because the our reflexes and our understandings of the world and the challenges we face are very similar, this is why mythology has similarities and this is why religions evolve and develop from a mythological substructure. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then so this mm. would be the basis of his sort of metaphorical truth about life is that mm-hmm. these stories are all essential things to learn if you want to flourish in life and so that, that and, and, okay so sorry to interrupt this is the fundamental difference peterson comes at it from the story and and from viewing ourselves in that story and saying this is how we this is how we've understood morality ethics this is how we've developed religion and what it means to be a good person that's right and harris is saying okay you can do away with all we don't need the story stories are important but do we need these stories from three thousand years ago why can't we just use our reason our intellect our understanding and find a good life that way but peterson is saying stories is how we think that is how we interpret he's right we cannot help but do that and he, he said this in the debate. He, he turns to Sam and he goes, so wh- what are you proposing, Sam? Like, a- as an alternative to these stories or just storytelling and archetypal stories as a method of, um, of passing on ideas, what are you suggesting? And Sam, I think, does a really poor job of, um, of giving an alternative. Every now and then he was like, oh, well, you know, art and culture and... Uh, that sort of thing, but it's it's not a very useful answer, mm. which I think is probably technically true because you know you might look at um, classic literature or, and well all all literature and you can probably dig out the stories in there, but I can definitely see uh, the attraction of the stories and the archetypal stories that Peterson's putting forward and the metaphorical truth behind them, the sort of Mm. evolutionary um, basis for why those stories are so important to us. Yeah. um, I will answer. Uh, Let's take a two-minute pit stop. Oh, yeah. All right, what what we're going to go good and evil? Okay, the different interpretations. All right, lay it so, out, Foss. Um, so Jordan Peterson did his homework in this debate, and he's he's done more than me. So he's read um, Harris's book. I think it's called The Moral Landscape. Yeah, I'm reading that. Okay, and so in the book, Harris lays out this position that as rational beings, if we understand that suffering is inherently bad in and of itself, um then the opposite is good. So he's got this idea of well-being. Needless suffering. Yeah, needless suffering. So it's this idea of well-being and a good world would be a world where we're maximizing or helping all beings to achieve that state of well-being. And we can kind of agree what that would look like. Um, and also the avoidance of a, of a state of maximal suffering. Okay, I can sort of follow along with you there. and um, But then he also makes this point. He said it towards the end of maybe the second debate. Um, he uses the example of a guy that went on a, a mass shooting rampage in Texas maybe 20 years ago. He shot like 20 people with a rifle or something. And he actually said when he was... Um, 
he said when when the police called him, he said, and he he got the death penalty, but he said to them, "Look, I want you to cut my brain up, and what's wrong with me? Because I I don't know why I'm doing this, but I I feel evil and I feel like I want to kill all these people, but I don't know why, because he'd never done anything like that before in his life, and and it turns out that the guy had a a brain tumor, and so it 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 was dysregulating his emotions and this is where all this homicidal impulse was coming from. And then Sam Harris, and and yeah, I can understand that, but I think it's, I, th- I think that's one case. Then he makes the point that if we understood more about the human brain, then we would eventually get to a point where we would understand all evil behavior from a biochemical standpoint and we would recognize that people aren't necessarily making moral choices um they're being driven by their but brains this is an archetypal story this is the the villain who late in the story you see the flashback into his early life where he was abused as a child no 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 but the thing is like not everyone that was abused becomes an abuser like you do have moral choices, and so Harris seems to be saying well, I'm that. Not, yeah, I don't think that absolves them. Well, no, no, but like, in this case, this guy had a brain tumor. Like it was very cut and dried what was going on, and so Harris seems to be saying that at some point in the future, we'll be able to look back and understand evil as a disorder of the brain, as having a physical cause. And Peterson's perspective, and while he would, while he would agree, didn't say okay, that guy was evil because he had a brain tumor, so he wasn't really evil. He just was sick. Peterson is laying out this view of the world that says people do have moral choices, people do have free will, and people have the capacity to be good or be evil. So and they make that choice. Peterson... This think, is the fundamental difference yeah, between yeah, the two. Yeah, this is a great example. So the guy with the golf ball tumor in his head, yeah, yeah. Peterson would still interpret his actions as evil? No. And, and like I wouldn't either, but I don't think you can extrapolate from that one instance to to all examples of human evil. And Sam Harris is basically saying that if we understood the brain and and human behavior, and human biology, and human psychology well enough, we would eventually understand that all of these are are examples of the human brain malfunctioning or disease or pathology. And What's the problem with that view? It seems like that would just create a more compassionate world. So you might still... I don't think it's accurate. You, I think there are perfectly... Oh, you just don't... Yeah, okay. yeah like it's my... Or, okay, I'm going to lay my cards on the table. It's my belief that there are perfectly functional, uh, conscious... Uh, so physiologically fine. Everything's fine. So the problem is where in, like, the, in the spirit. Okay, let's say within normal limits. Yeah. And they have moral choices and people who become evil it's because they've continually made the wrong moral choice and they've taken that choice freely Mm, yeah (laughs) that would definitely be the point of contention with harris yeah have have you heard the whole his free will argument basically that there is no free will i think he's totally wrong i find he's uh his argument very compelling when I hear it, but it just I don't know where to go next with it. And does it bear any correlation to your lived experience? No. <laughs> There's the problem. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, well, you have yeah, you still have this sense that you have free will. Yeah, and, and so I, I guess the counter position to that and, and this is what sold me on I guess listening to this lecture, it was a conversion experience for me because I realized that the Bible and these ancient religious texts and I realized that there was something genuinely true there. It was when I heard Jordan Peterson talk about, um, I think it was biblical lecture, either three or four, the Cain and Abel story. And if you haven't listened to it, give it a listen. Have you listened to it? No, I've seen the movie. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so the biblical lecture on Cain and Abel, it, it was like, to me, it was compelling. And it really spoke to me on a deep level because 
So, are you aware of the story of Cain and Abel? Uh, very roughly. All right. Go so, on, I'll just the, run through it. Basically, what happens is, um, uh, so Sorry. Cain and Abel are the first two human beings, because Adam and Eve were created by God. Cain and Abel are their children. Abel uh, makes a sacrifice, and God is pleased with the sacrifice. Cain makes a sacrifice. Is that where the term Abel comes from? He's an Abel person. Probably. Yeah, right. Maybe there's a connection. I'm not sure. And then Cain makes a sacrifice and God rejects his sacrifice. And Why does he do that? The story's not really clear. It works in mysterious ways. Well, and so, like, it's sort of left open, but... And Peterson makes the point that but perhaps, perhaps his intentions weren't good. Perhaps he didn't give the best of what he had. Perhaps he didn't really try hard enough. But perhaps it was just, like capricious and 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 because sometimes life is not fair what does capricious mean like it's i'm just throwing it out there (laughs) we'll have to look that one up no no but i I guess the more accurate word is like it's not really clear and sometimes life is just not fair because that's the nature of life itself right and so cain has a choice like he can go back and try harder be a better person oh right and 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 look at himself and and look and say, hey, where can I improve? Or he does what he does and he gets angry, he gets resentful and he hates his brother and he kills his brother. Right. He gets angry at reality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He becomes resentful and bitter. Yeah. And taking that road, it leads him towards murder and he does murder. And then God comes and finds... Uh, comes and finds Cain and says, look, what have you done? Your your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And, and this is why you shouldn't take the Bible literally. <laughs> because no one's blood is crying yeah. out from the ground. Like, it, it, it's it's a figure of speech, but but it, it's it's for dramatic effect. And, and, and Cain says, oh, am I my brother's keeper? And, and God says to Cain, like, sin lies at the door, but you must rule over it. And it wants to, it wants to, the image is like a sexual image that sin is like some sort of animal which is wants to mingle with you and, and know you intimately. It's a bit weird, but... Um, Seems like your base uh, instincts. And, and this to, is what... To take the... Uh, yeah. <coughs> what's, what's, how to put it, so you, you know, immediate gratification to, to mm-hmm. take the temptation, the... The impulsive move, yeah, impulsive, but also instinctual. Because um, mm. our if we, because I believe we evolved from monkeys, and so our we've got very strong aggressive impulses, especially as males, and and you can't sort of let them win, so to speak, because it's a bad long term strategy. But anyway, and so and then God curses Cain, um, so and and what I got from the story, and, and Peterson presents it as you have to look at this on a couple of different levels. And one level is you look at it as they're two hostile brothers and they're at war with each other. They're two sides of the human psyche. So you've got this side which is aiming up towards the light and and the good. And you've got this other side which is resentful, bitter, and just wants to... And this is the idea that good things happen to good people and bad mm. things. Peterson's got some axiom for it. Well, no. To, well, to well the no, no, no. But the point is that the point is, if the two sides are the same psyche, like we have a part of ourselves which is good and a part of ourselves which is bad, but and then in that space, in that line between good and evil, you have a choice. Mm. And, and and for me, it just rang so true, and, and I realized that there were times in my own life where where I'd let bitterness and resentment get the best of me and um and and when i acted from that space life just gets worse like when i wouldn't take responsibility and when i was angry at the world and hostile and when i was refusing to say hey maybe this is something to do with me maybe i could be better when i was blaming other people life just gets worse and this is the point of the story and and but you could get this same message from a different story couldn't you like there's probably a absolutely no 
and there are other stories like this. So there's a Native American proverb, and um, uh, this grandfather talks to his grandson, and he says to him, you know, inside your heart, um, you have two wolves. Oh, yeah. A white wolf and a yeah. black wolf. And the white wolf is good and the black wolf is bad and evil. And 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 is and then he says to him, like, it's it's the one you feed. Mm. And so your actions uh your actions change your character. And this is the idea. So if you make a good action, this is like almost goes back to what Aristotle says, excellence is what you repeatedly do. But the flip side is true as well. So so do you think all of these different schools of thought like the indians are basically another religion you think they're just as correct as the christian view like the idea of justice correct i'm like oh i don't know i guess i sh- i share the petersonian but, but you view. think it's legitimate though right yeah 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 well i wouldn't say justice correct i would agree with peterson saying that there are cross-cultural similarities because our brains are structured the same way and I view religion as a progression, as an evolution towards a higher understanding of consciousness. Right. And not just of consciousness, but of human life and human interaction. It has to be. And Yeah. And so... Th- th- there's one more thing I wanted to say. I, I-, I guess... And then, then I'll let you talk. So I guess for me, the Cain and Abel story, it just rung so true in my life. And, and because I, I'd experienced that experience. Like, I've never murdered anyone, but there's been times where I've had disappointments, I've had setbacks. Like, I've failed, at, I've failed university a couple of times and I've always just blamed external circumstances. Right. It was my parents' fault. It was this guy's fault. It was that girlfriend's fault, that ex. And oh, it was the teacher. And my life kept getting progressively worse. And I guess I finally realized that I can't control the world and blaming the world is a f- you know, is an exercise in futility because you can't really impact it. Yeah, well, this is like the first stoic principle of some things are under your control and some things are not. Yeah, and so there's a synthesis here. Mm. and um, and But it, it took listening to that Jordan Peterson clip and I realized that I did have a choice. And So do you think the difference was the power of that story to illustrate the point because you've probably heard the concept before right but never had it sink in so do you think it was something peterson is is a is a compelling speaker and um i know i think i think he's got a very deep insight into the depths of human misery because one of his maxims is almost that life is suffering yeah and and when i hear that i'm like it is yeah, but it's not as terrible as it sounds when you first hear it. It's not all pointless suffering. No, no, it's it's not all pointless. But that's what it sounds like to the to someone who hears that the first time. That's what it sounded like to me. I thought, oh god, that's dark. But what he means that there's there is some needless suffering that gets you nowhere. Probably not much in Peterson's view. And then there's a suffering which has a silver lining, so, so to say. You you learn something. You grow uh, stronger. Peterson's yeah. dark, man, yeah. and, and the, the suffering is deep, and, and like I, I totally agree. And if you, and, and this is the thing, Peterson always, and I think this is another fundamental difference between Harrison and no, Harris, Harris and Peterson, is Harris is always like, we've got to use reason to understand the world. We've got to, we've got to use our intellect, and then we reason towards moral principles. And Peterson is always like, no. We, we have to use reason, yes, but we have to examine history. You have to examine the nuts and bolts of human life throughout the ages. And when you look at history, it's a bloodbath. Humans are brutal. Humans yeah. torture each other. But Humans I, kill each other. I keep seeing it Where as... Harris seems to live in this... He wants to live in this pristine world of reason, yeah, which yeah, to he, me he's got this doesn't idea correlate with, with reality. Or it doesn't correlate with how humans think and how we understand the world. So it seems that Harris has this idea that we should basically do away with all all of religion, that it's that it's so fraught with bad ideas that you basically just need to throw out the whole lot and start again. No, no, he makes. So I'll let you finish. He makes one point. He says we have to look for the important psychological truths in the rubble. Right. Okay. So maybe you'll pick 
but, but some to keep. Yeah, but the dogmatic elements, the ritualistic elements, he's he's perfectly happy to just throw yeah. it all away. So it seems that he's pretty happy to th- throw away, say, what ninety five percent of it. Basically, yeah. Basically, <coughs> Peterson's coming the other way. He's not dismissing what Sam's saying. He's actually agreeing. Like he doesn't dispute uh, any of the science or or statistics that Sam might present in terms of what constitute w- constitutes well-being. Um, Peterson Peterson agrees that you can have both basically that they're not mutually exclusive. Sam seems to act as though they sort of are that science and religion can't coexist. Whereas I think Peterson's claim is that. Uh, you can adopt scientific understanding into religion to evolve uh, the ideas within it and 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 to just support some of the ones that are already legitimate um, and, and that you don't have to be completely dismissive of the other half, whereas it seems Sam seems a bit combative on that point. Mm. All right, so we've reached an hour. <laughs> so I reckon let's go... Let's make it personal. Let's. How about you? Do you want to finish or do you want to talk first? Yeah, I can finish. Yeah. No, no. I, I'll keep going. What do you think we talk about? No, I, I reckon let's. We've talked about Harris, the uh, Peterson and Harris. Yeah. I keep wanting to call him Harris. We thrashed that. So, so let let's let's continue in the same vein, but um, like how about you spend five minutes and just. Well, not nail your position, but like, what's your take on it? Where do you sit, um, atheist or not? Let's okay. Yeah, one thing I'd like to to point out is that Sam Harris actually isn't an atheist. If if you define an atheist as someone who does not believe in God, as in believes that God does not exist. Sam Harris, if you dig back through his stuff, he's actually agnostic. So he takes a scientific view of the world. So he's seen no evidence for God. So he thinks it's highly unlikely that there's a God. So he's going to act in a way as though God does not exist. But he he uses the term atheist just because it's so much simpler. If you say agnostic, everyone goes, oh, well, he's on the... He's on the wall about it. He's on the fence. He, he's 50-50. Yeah, okay. Whereas Sam Harris is actually 99% no, but but he's open to any possibility. That's why, like, in the debate, he says, mm. maybe Jesus did rise from the grave. But I'm, I'm going to... I, I was intrigued when he said that. Oh, well, but And this is the thing, that people think, like, he will never say that it definitely didn't happen because he, he, he has no evidence that it did not happen. Yeah, yeah. So he'll just say... From what I understand, it probably didn't happen. And so I'm going to act in a way as though it didn't happen. Mm. Anyway, um, all right, I'll, I'll uh, outline my <laughs> philosophical position. So I, I like I always start with fund, like the way I think is I need to have some sort of fundamental principle, which is actually interesting after hearing about this a priori structure yeah, yeah. and having axioms like I, I, d- I didn't understand that before I didn't know what those words meant but you were doing it already yeah basically yeah. so yeah I suppose my axioms that, that everything else is built upon is <coughs> is pretty simple and it's probably a bit of an immature philosophy but I'll, it's working for me at the moment so I always like to think uh, m- my first sort of principle that I think about is here in the present moment, which is the only moment, you you have a choice. If you want, you could do nothing. You could just lay down on the ground now, and that's it. You're gonna you're just not gonna ever do anything again. And and you'll just fade away into the ground, and eventually you'll die after a while. So that's one choice. And and this is my juvenile version of the. Sam Harris's worst suffering for everyone all the time and and Peterson's I don't know how he defines his but he's he's evil and bad it's it's sort of the equivalent this is this is how I think about it on a personal level I could just lay down and do nothing I could probably do worse than that because I could go out and do evil to others 
but let's use that as starting point. So then I'm like, well, so I've got to get up and do something. So then it's then I sort of jump into the Peterson way of thinking where I'm like, well, I might as well have a high ideal and that should be basically for me is the opposite of suffering. So uh, I like how Peterson says um, uh, you should do what's good for me and then what's good for my family and then what's good for my community and then what's good for society. That's a good simple way to think about um, what what might be a good way to behave. So I sort of that's how I think about it, um, and then, and then from there I just I've, I've got this really complex theory on um, well not complex but just hard to describe theory on how I orientate myself towards goals. But basically, you should like Peterson says, pick a very lofty goal, aim towards that, and just have a red hot crack at it. And if you do that, and the goal is well orientated, and it's a goal that aligns with the with uh, minimizing suffering for yourself, your family, your community, and others. If it's a goal that seems to align with that and you go after it, that's probably going to be a good way to expend your life. I don't think there's an afterlife at all. Um, But my idea is I think it's a miracle that we get to the opportunity to experience consciousness and live. And every now and then I sit down and contemplate that and think how statistically unlikely it is that we're sitting here doing this. Like when you think about it, it just blows my mind how unusual this is, the amount of things that had to line up for this to happen. So I think that I'm incredibly fortunate uh, and then that rolls on to, into a sort of um, sort of philosophy of gratitude, recognising your position in the world that I always, when I think about my fil- um, my finance philosophy for life, I start that with what's my most valuable thing that I own and the most valuable thing I own is a Australian citizenship because just by having that, you're already filthy rich and you already have so many safety nets below you, financially speaking. Um, So I always like to think of that, how fortunate I am. And that, for some reason, takes the pressure off me to want to succeed based on, uh, you know, these ideas you get from social media and whatever that you want to be this superstar. Because I'm like, well, I've already got it really, really good. And being filthy rich won't necessarily uh, improve my ability to do good in the world all that much. Mm. Anyway, that that would be like chapter one of my life philosophy. Right. That's sort of what motivates me in the morning. Is my mic still going? Mic's on. Mic check. It's on? Yeah. I don't feel like I'm getting it through my headphones. Oh. How's that? Hello? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's better, but better. Cool, cool, cool. Is mine really loud? No, no, that, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, so um, I guess what... I'll just clarify what you've said. So basically you've outlined, uh, I guess, a moral philosophy, uh, a way of being in the world that's focused on on the life we actually have in front of us and it's sort of grounded in in gratitude and appreciation for for what we're given um and it's really for me it's yeah, yours are a bit loud so does that make it quieter yeah that's better better is that good yeah that's, that's good yeah so f- for me um My experience with like having a personal philosophy because I grew up basically without one, okay, and didn't have you know I was baptized, we didn't have much religious teaching. And I remember when I was nineteen, I read, I sort of went on this mission and read a heap of classic literature. And throughout all this classic literature, they you know they're just constantly discussing moral and ethics, uh, morals and ethics. It's basically the subject matter of most classic literature. And they were, they were speaking a language that I didn't know when they're talking about virtues and vices. Like I just, I'd never heard the language. At school, they never talked about it. It was just, I, I'd have to Google what virtue meant because I'd, and I had to keep doing it. So I've sort of tacked together this rough life philosophy, which is very pragmatic, very practical, and it's short and simple. And, it's, and all it is is... A, is a set of these rules that I've worked out that I can live by. And if I live by them, 
uh, generally things go pretty well. So, but it's fairly cobbled together. And and I probably come from the school of Sam Harris. Like I've been listening to him for at least five or six years. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And in all that time, he has not delivered a alternate, say, book to to refer to for a set of rules to live by that will lead to a, lead to a good outcome in life. And this is what I think his massive shortcoming is. And he'll just wave his hand at classic literature and art and and culture and say, "Oh, it's all there," but that's not very useful. Like it's just this flood of information. It's too much. And, and to go through it and pick out, which is basically what I've done, to go through and pick out some useful rules has taken a long time and a lot of trial and error. And uh, so uh, I, I definitely think that's a shortcoming of his. Of yeah. his. Anyway, what's your life philosophy, Fascinator? Um Jesus Christ, amen. Uh, not at all. Well, like, uh, as you're aware... How has it been going back to church? Okay. Explain well, that to us. All right, so I'll, I'll start with the church and then I'll get into my life philosophy. Yeah. So... Um, it, church has been interesting, but like at the same time, a little bit frustrating because you have conversations and, and I feel like I'm just talking, we're just, we're talking straight past each other. Yeah. Like I know what they're telling me, but I don't think they know what to do with what I'm telling them because I've realized I, I don't really fit into a neat category because I've got a quite a strong church upbringing so i understand what they're talking about but um in terms of my worldview uh i don't think it really well it, it fits but like these categories of are you saved are you going to heaven are you living for god like i've just heard them so many times that they're just cliches to me right um but but at the same yeah I, I don't know like I am really enjoying it and I, I, I'm I've met some interesting people but uh, do you find the conversations with them uh, not very open minded like the people you're talking to no no it, it depends and like I had a conversation with a guy and um, like it was a guy I knew from UWA actually and he he was a very intelligent guy and he was sort of talking about this theologian called David Bentley Hart and. Uh, Oh, bless you David Bentley Hart is a pretty thank you he, like I read his stuff and I'm just confused because he's so smart and he, oh, wow. every sentence you read a word and you're like I don't know what it means yeah but like he's a, uh, and, and he, he's not a stereotypical thinker at all but no yes I have had some good conversations but um, like overall I've liked it I think I'm going to keep going and I, I think also I think I want to persist a little bit and like give it a chance and try and actually form some relationships with people. Yeah. And also I'm I'm realizing as I get older that it doesn't really matter if people don't understand me or don't agree with me on everything. It doesn't really matter. No. Um and I, maybe that's a like a newfound maturity or something. Like you're not really threatened by people with a different Well, you've probably view. lost that sort of level of cognitive dissonance. Yeah, yeah. Just from the exposure you've had to all these really challenging ideas. So yeah. you don't feel as threatened no, anymore. And, and also, like, uh, I think definitely when I was younger, uh, I grew up in a very literally minded Christian sect. And um, there was this huge focus on are you saved? Are you going to make heaven your home? And the whole conversation is really about like it's really about the afterlife and because right, the way yeah. they portray it is is that if you're alive for 80 years but then you're alive for eternal life after that then what's more important yeah well that that's and so a massive shift in perspective this life is devalued yeah and yeah. so like i i through i i guess through jordan peterson i now view the bible as I'm not a literalist. I'm not a young earth creationist. So where are you on uh, what happens after death? I don't know. 
And I think that's the most honest answer. But you're not going to live... You're not going to act as though, oh, it's okay, I've got another, you know, forever after this one. Well... Because it seems to me that it would be rational, even if you, you know, you just thought... the microwave. You thought maybe yeah. uh, that's going to happen, that, well, I should live this life as though it's the only one I got, just in case. Well... And and see, I've been exploring the thought of a of an Anglican theologian called N.T. Wright, and he's an expert on early New Testament history. And so, this idea of that if you're a Christian and you accept these moral propositions and these statements about the world, then you get to go to heaven. That's most people's understanding of Christianity. Mm-hmm. You accept these set of intellectual propositions. You live a certain way. You practice these rituals, you go to church on Sunday, you hang out with other religiously minded people. Yeah. Then when you die, your reward for being a good person is you get to go to heaven. And it's like, motivating to do those things. Yeah, but if you don't believe in it, it's not motivating. No. And and you can see through it. Straight um, away, yeah. It's well, like an illusion just burns. not not straight away, but so uh, Sam Harris says this thing. And I don't think that that's what Christianity is saying. And so... What, you don't think... Wait, it's not saying what? It's not saying that if you're a good person, if you believe in Jesus, you get to go to heaven when you die. Oh. It's not saying that. It's so revolutionary. Yeah. And, and then like no one knows this. And this is what I is, thought. Is that Peterson's interpretation also? No, no, this is N.T. Wright. And this uh, is actually... Okay. This is pretty orthodox Christianity. But it's just that there's so much misunderstanding and and I guess diversions from like what it actually is. He believes that there's an afterlife. Who? NT Wright. No, no. So NT Wright, his position, and he he speaks Greek, and he's like went to Oxford and stuff, and he's in the Church of England. So he's a very well respected <laughs> theologian, uh-huh. and so. And and when I read what he says and then I compare it with what my understanding of the Bible, what I read in the Bible, I'm like, oh, he's probably right. So the Christian story is actually this, that God somehow became man in Jesus Christ. Have you, have you heard this before? No. Really? No. Oh, wow. You never heard this? No. That he walked <laughs> in the feet. Yeah. In the body of Jesus. No, no. He was Jesus. He was Jesus. Yeah. Uh So. Jesus was God. It's called a hypostatic union. So that means you've got two natures united in one spirit, in one being. Okay. So he was fully God and fully man at the same time. It's a mystery. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so there's this sense where the and 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 the Christian monothe- monotheistic tradition is that God is beyond space and time. God is beyond all human understanding. God is like we just can't wrap our minds around it because he he's infinite and we're finite. It, it's sort of like this is one analogy I've had. It's, it's sort of like, do you remember when you were five years old and you thought, I want to be a policeman when I grow up? Yeah. But you, you can sort of understand. But now you look back at that five-year-old self and you realize that five-year-old had no understanding, couldn't even grasp the idea of what the experience of being an adult was like. Right, yeah. It was just removed and so far beyond the experience. Yeah. Multiply that by like a thousand and that's how that's that's like the human being compared to infinite being itself. Yeah. Uh man, this is really interesting because this is obviously a yeah. This is something where I don't get the intuition whatsoever. Like it just doesn't yeah register with me at all. Yeah, so so God is the infinite. Like God is beyond space and time. Like beyond our human understanding. But then somehow, and this is the Christian story, God becomes man. And it's not like he's God wearing a human skin. He's both at the same time. Like It's kind of mind-blowing. It's an interesting theory. 
this is the story and, and you can sort of do with it what you will yeah and and then and then he lives his life he becomes a teacher and he claims that he because of the claims that he makes he gets in trouble with the roman authorities and they execute him because he's well i think the jews accuse him of being blasphemous because he claims to be god and in, okay. in the Jewish monotheistic tradition, if God is beyond space and time, it's obviously, it, it's... So when they kill him, does it, he like, die? If you're a human being and you claim to be God, you're a bad person. So right? when they kill him, does only one being die and God lives on? And so like, like God isn't like... This is where we get to the mystery. You can't kill God, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, it's, and so like, it, it's sort of... Oh my God, are you saying God is dead? Oh you'll God. wrap like you'll wrap your mind up in knots trying to understand. So <laughs> he gets he gets killed by the Romans, and then he rises again three days later, and somehow in that process of him dying, and so and the and the understanding is that because he was fully human, and he suffered and died then he understands fully the human experience and in some strange, mysterious way, he's defeated death itself. And so the Christian hope is not that we get to go to heaven, but that because Jesus, who is God and man, mysterious at the same time, died, somehow sin and the sense somehow evil and death were defeated because it doesn't make any sense to me. This <laughs> yeah, is the I'm story. Struggling here. <laughs> no, and like, like this is the story. And, and so, well, evil can't have been defeated because then there was so much evil later in history. Yeah, like there's an explanation for that. So, oh, a- and so this is the Christian story: a God who's infinite and beyond the known universe becomes united to to the human and they're the same being and there's no separation and meaning like all humans or just no just, just jesus. jesus in particular oh, yeah. and so and then the implications for the human race is that we live forever not because we go to heaven but because we get resurrected like from the dead reincarnated no not reincarnated so th- the christian hope is that there'll come a time in history oh where god the end times no no where god will raise the dead and they will receive a new body yeah i've heard this yeah yeah and so but but it'll be it'll be a physical body and then earth itself so hev- be, heaven on earth heaven on earth yeah literally but then there's also at the same time there's this idea that like if you believe in Jesus and are part of the church, that somehow Jesus is mysteriously operating inside you and through you. And so the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is somehow coming into being through humans themselves in this lifetime. And mm. so it's not like this life doesn't matter. It's actually this life is all that matters. And heaven right. itself and paradise is a complete restoration or reparation of everything that's wrong but that means you do get another life once you get restored yeah but it's a life it's not it's not respawn bro it's not disembodied huh like disembodied well no so when you're in heaven there's this idea that you're you're just like a spirit or something um do you come back for another mortal life i think you're immortal and and like and and I, i i guess there's a part of me which feels that it's that it, you know that psychologically there's sort of this idea that all humans have this unconscious terror of death and so christianity is the ultimate like panacea for this unconscious unnamed right. fear of extinction and non-being mm. that if you follow in this tradition then then you never have to truly die um yeah, well, but but the, the, also Peterson frames it in these terms of that, 
like the reason why Jesus' sacrifice was perfect was because he was the divine and the human. And somehow, because the divine came and became human, then the human becomes divine. And there's something about the voluntary acceptance of suffering that is redemptive. And, and this is Peterson's point when you get him going. Yeah. Yep. Like, and, and like when I talk about this and try to explain it, it's like, to me, it just sounds like my mind feels like it's just getting tangled up in knots. Is that because there's parts of it which um not just counterintuitive, but, not, uh, you know, you just have a really hard time explaining it with your rational mind? Like, goes against your rational intuitions? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, but, but also, I think this goes back to what I was saying earlier about how we've, there's a sense where we've been conditioned to view human life as a closed system and that our interactions are with other humans, with other animals, with the earth itself, with with physical life. And so our modern philosophy says this is all there is. It's a closed system. Whereas ancient people and even medieval people, they believed in more an open system where the like something from outside of humanity, some other consciousness or form of being yeah, could come into human life. I think this is that thing where Sam Harris would say, well, that's literally not true, so we shouldn't believe in it. And I think... <clears throat> Peterson, I don't think he would actually say that it's literally true, but I think he would argue that it's so valuable that it becomes a metaphorical truth yeah. because that is a uh, belief system that is is worthy of adopting and, and living by. Yeah, and, and I, I can see your point, but I think there are aspects of it which, which are... Which are matters of I've got this interesting theory. Of, of of historical either fact or fiction. Like, obviously, did because it happened two thousand years ago. Did Jesus live? And these are these things that can verify. Did Jesus live? Did he die? Did so he rise again? I've got this interesting theory, right? Go ahead. that Peterson. <clears throat> so you've got Sam Harris, who's basically an atheist. You've got Peterson, who is actually agnostic but believes heavily in the power of, say, religious stories, archetypal stories and belief systems. And then this is, this is my sort of Peterson conspiracy theory. My theory is that Peterson does not think that it would be good for, say, the masses to understand religion in the way he understands it. Because if you understand it from an agnostic viewpoint, the way I just described it, so, oh yeah, it's a useful set of stories to live by. All of a sudden... He doesn't say that, but... No, 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 this is just my... Just go with me here. This is my conspiracy okay, theory. Okay, okay, okay. That, <clears throat> that he thinks for the masses, they need to literally believe in it. Because then they're much more, oh. more, more likely to follow it and act on it. It'll be... Uh, so much more powerful for them. Whereas if you're agnostic, it's you're real dismissive of it, and you sort of yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't really believe it. Mm, mm. This, okay. this is just my theory. Well, yeah, and this is why I think he's so hard to pin down on it because he doesn't want to burst the bubble. Okay, okay, I, I understand why you think that, but I don't think that's what's going on. I'm not convinced of it either. It's just yeah, yeah, but it's it's a, it's an interesting theory. And, and this is something that Sam Harris doesn't seem to comprehend. Like, like humans exist at all different levels of intelligence. Yeah, yeah. Sam, yeah, I think Sam he's Harris so and, blind to yeah. how the normal people see the world. Sam yeah. Harris and Jordan Peterson are like, you know... Yeah, point, I, IQs would be like 150, 160, something like that. Yeah, yeah, but they're in the top, like, you know, one in 10,000 people in terms of their IQ. Or, like, at least... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like, right. Yeah. They're really, really Super smart. Yeah. And so it follows that um, people who aren't as intelligent, aren't as gifted verbally and academically will have a much simpler, more rudimentary structure of belief. Yeah, well, this is... That's like, not a bad thing. I'm a good example of this, right? Mm. So I've followed the Sam Harris recommended method of developing a, a set of beliefs. Though I acknowledge that you know, the, this is sort of surface level that most of my beliefs are sort of built into me. Um, 
uh, so I've done it the way he's, he's done it, but I don't have his intelligence. So like I've read Aristotle and Pluto and all of that. Have I you? Yeah, yeah. I do, wow. but I can't remember. It. Whereas, whereas Harris, when he's talking about it, he'll just be quoting lines from all these from all this classic literature. So, so does Peterson. And so he's yeah. got this constant compass, which is made up of culture, art, literature, whatever. This is Harris. And I think he assumes that everyone could have that, but we can't. What we need... We're not smart enough. Yeah, that's me. I'm literally not smart enough. I've got this... I've made my own Bible. I've got this document on my computer, which is literally my set of principles that that I live by, which have basically just been... They're just extracts from all these philosophical books I've read. And people uh, have hit Sam Harris up about this a number of times, and he, he always just waves his hand at, you know, literature, culture, and art. And that's where I think the the problem is. He doesn't. But he's Peterson, so smart that yeah. that he. But w- what we need. Let me just finish this. Yeah, yeah. What we need, say the atheist follows, and this actually does exist, is like a book that gives us a set of rules based on philosophy, art, and culture. But the problem is, as soon as you write that book, you've got dogmatism, the same as the religious problem that they're trying to mm. fight against. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm getting tired. So, so I, am I. Yeah, I think I'm going to wrap up, but I, okay. I'm I'm going to go... Final thoughts. So, my final thoughts, you, you said that if you write that book, then you run into the problem of dogmatism. Yeah. So, I just want to, like, go at that point a little bit. I agree. Religious dogma and intolerance and, like, not listening to others' perspectives. This is sort of what's... This is one of the ugliest sides of religion. You meet a religious person... And you get into an argument with them and they tell you you're going to hell or whatever. And and it, it's and they don't listen to you, they don't respect you. They don't you. engage. And by not engaging, they're not respecting your intelligence and your capacity and insight as a human being in your own right. Yeah. And so I guess I would say that the way they're acting is actually in contradiction to the teachings of Christianity. Right. So, to be open and- no, Christianity doesn't teach you to. Um, it doesn't teach you to be right. It doesn't say the highest virtue is to be right and to win arguments about about the world. Right. Like Jesus said, that the the greatest. But it, they don't no, exactly no. think that scientific inquiry is is the way to go either, right? Some of them. There, there are a lot of Christians who, and myself included, who believe that Christianity is perfectly compatible with science. And I, I don't see any conflict. Like, there's conflicts in the philosophy and the worldview, but in, in terms of like... Like, if, if you took a literal reading of the Bible, obviously you could find contradictions. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, you, but like, but you've already outlined that you think a literal reading is the wrong reading. Yeah, yeah, I understand. It, it's sort of like, like, y- you know, y- you have to read it but in that the would genre be the, that it's that would written. be the typical atheist um, response to that. Yeah, but they're arguing against some like. Well, well one of the problems with like, say, you, no, you, no. Let me finish my point. So, so my, my point was like the whole dogmatism point is like. No one wants to be like a dogmatic, argumentative, small-minded person who's trying to tell other people they're wrong. And Jesus said, like, the greatest commandment is to love God, whatever that means. If God is infinite, then what does it mean to love Him? I don't know. And then the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor. So it it doesn't say... I get your interpretation, but is that how the majority of Christians... Are interpreting it also. Is that how they interpret, or is that how they live? Is that how they live? That's not how they live. No. Yeah. So and, and so, and it, is that because they haven't really understood it, or they haven't really integrated it? And it goes back to Peterson's point, where he says, "I act as if there's a God," and people are saying, "Oh, you're not really answering the question." He is answering the question, because his belief is that. If you really want to know what someone's beliefs are, what the axioms are, and who they are, look at their actions. And so he's saying, he, he, he's, it's a veiled reference to his belief. He's saying, I act as if there's a God, 
And the Christian understanding of God is that it's this, I'm going to use some Latin, it's amago Deo, I think. And which, which is the understanding that um, humanity is made in the image of God. And so this is a, it's an idea of the divinity of the, of the individual. And most Christians don't really fully understand the implications. But the implication is that if everyone we're talking with and discussing with, whether it's Sam Harris or Jordan Peterson or, or you know, the forklift driver at work or... <laughs> you know, the Indonesian housemaid or, or whoever, yeah, or someone we really don't agree with, that they're a person made in the image of God. And so if you get a little bit Petersonian, so what does made in the image of God mean from a Petersonian lens? It's someone that's a fragile, mortal creature. So the animal, the fragile, they're limited, they're, they're mortal. But there's also this element of the divine there's this aspect of the infinite, which is human consciousness itself. And so whenever you're encountering and talking to another human being, you should respect them because there is a sense where there's something infinite and of infinite value about each human being that you talk to. And so, and when I hear love your neighbor, that's kind of what I hear. Um, but oh, that sounds like a good interpretation. Interpretation but is everything. Yeah, but also and, and the, you it, need it, to be able to spread that it goes that, back, that mode of interpretation. Well, it goes back to my first point. And my first point was um, the Bible is not a book. It's not an instruction manual. It's a library. And if you if you look at the you look at the word itself Bible, biblio, what's a bibliography? It's a reference list. The Makes 60 sense. there's 66 books. And there's so many different genres in there, and you have to, and like, uh, I guess I've, I've, I'm only coming to this understanding in the last year, that there's so much which I just never understood. Like, it, it's a book written thousands of years ago. It's not easy to understand, which is why people get it wrong all the time. Well, if more Christians are like you, I think it'd be a good thing for us. I got a good religious story for you. Go. <coughs> that I experienced the other day. I had an experience in uh, Borneo. Have you ever heard of Dungduk music? <laughs> no. Are, are you going to sing some Dungduk? Yeah. Okay, no, no. Let me paint the picture right. So right. I'm, I'm in, uh, um, in the basically the middle of the jungle, in a town called Plank, near a town called Plank Lanbun. Is this recently? Yeah, this is a couple of weeks ago. Okay. This is a, uh, Indonesian Independence Day. And it's like a fair. It's like a you know they have stalls set up on a big oval and they have sack races for the kids and all these weird competitions. They have this competition where they have a post like a like a telephone post um, set up and they just dig a hole in the oval and plant it in there and then they coat it with grease and there's teams of four blokes and they have to climb to the top. So like one guy stands at the bottom, hugs the pole, and then the next one climbs and then the next one climbs. And it's real greasy, so they keep falling down. Sounds erotic. Yeah, it was pretty entertaining. Anyway, and then there's this stage. And uh, so this is uh, Kalimantan, so it's not quite Sharia law, but it's not too far off. Mm. Like uh, alcohol is illegal and all the women are covered up. Or oh, not all the women, all the Muslim women. There are Christians there and whatnot. Um, anyway, then there's a stage set up with a girl singing. And I look over and this girl's got a, uh, like a mini skirt on. Oh, and he is. And, you know, her head uncovered. And she's quite good looking. And she's wa- wailing away, singing some Indonesian sort of pop music. So she's Indonesian? She's Indonesian. Okay. Backstory is, turns out. And, and and I noticed when I looked at it over there that all the crowd pretty much seemed to be men. There was a few women scattered in there, but not men. She's many. Heaps of men. And after like 20 minutes these old men start like climbing on stage and dancing with her and they're like sweating and some of them are looking real anxious and just acting all weird. <laughs> anyway, I asked guys with and he was like, oh yes, that's the Dung Duk. And so the Dung Duk singer is there to tempt the men and test their faith. So the men are supposed to be, what, what you know, faithful to their wives and, oh. and resist basically promiscuous women. And so she's this giant symbol of 
promiscuity and temptation and lustfulness and all that sort of stuff wow and the idea is that you get as close to her as you can and you feel the rage inside <laughs> of you and the lust and then you and then you resist it and then that that strengthens your faith and your commitment to your faith i think i just go home and have a massive crank oh if, if and that's that. what they all have done and by the end <laughs> by the end of the day they're like reaching on stage and touching her legs and it just looked horrendous Poor how girl. did you feel Oh, like creeped out, but <laughs> worried for the girl. Like, like if this is a thing. Apparently, like it's a genre of music. Do you reckon there was a gangbang afterwards? Oh, well, not. Like, who knows? But well, I imagine those poor girls get subjected to some pretty horrible shit because they've got like a crowd of extremely turned on blokes. You know, who never see this type of thing. Just to see if. Hard dicks. And and the other thing was, I asked the guys I was with and they were like, I was like, how do you think about the girl? And and they said, everyone hates her. So she's performing a necessary role, but everyone hates her. All the women hate her. All the men ha- hate her because they think she's basically evil. She's a temptation, but she's necessary. Yes, yeah, so to me, that's a sick society. And I, I guess like... Um, yeah, I'm not lumping all of religion. Yeah, that, yeah. It's an interesting and experience. yeah. It, it was the first time I've seen collective sort of a, a collective, what's the word, sort of fever, you know, in this crowd that it just looked like at the drop of a hat. She was going to get right. It could just go out of control. And in this same region, yeah. only 10, uh, 1999, they had um, mass killings, a couple of thousand people were killed, ethnic yeah. violence. It was religious violence. Yeah. Anyway, finish on a happy note. Absolutely. Yeah, so... Um, and, and I think I have to agree with you. And the it, it seems like religious... And then what, to me, what you're describing is like... That seems to be the remnants of an ancient ritual. And so somehow it's necessary to keep the peace or... It, it's, a, it's an enactment of something... But but also like I feel like there's it's a society where there's a lot of sexual repression. Yeah. And yeah. um and, and it's an easy target to criticize. Yeah, but like you also see that sexual repression in a lot of fundamentalist Christian circles where um and it, it's quite common for these, you know, prominent Christian figures and pastors and stuff to have affairs and and, and like uh and and this is one of my sort of major this is one of the things which i think like in the in the wider i guess more oh, what's the word so in the wider understanding of christianity and it is there in the bible as well like there seems to be this condemnation of of sex and sexuality um yeah, I'd like to hear and an it, evolutionary perspective on that. Well, it's hard. Well, it's hard for me to reconcile because I, I think that I think there's dangers on both sides. I think there is inherent dangers in repressing the sexual urges because I think it comes out in twisted ways. But I think there's also dangers in just letting it. Oh yeah. Letting Go it have checked. Yeah, and and because like you think about it, like even the most free, liberated person. The vast majority of the time, they don't follow their sexual impulses. Like, just to live in a society, we need to uh, regulate our sexual impulses. It's just a question of degree. So, um, are there ideas in the Bible which you think you could not reconcile and that, that basically they just got it wrong? It was just, that's wrong. There's no positive interpretation of it. It's just, that needs to be cut out of the next version. No. no? Because I, I view it. And I'm going back to, I've said this a couple of times, it's a collection of books. It's a library. It's the history of... Yeah, and I suppose in literature, literature you still have bad stories in there and it's not like you read them and go, oh, I'm going to go out and do that thing. No, no, but like it, like not everything it says in the Bible is... is just, it, it's not necessarily telling you to do that. And so there's certain things where it says, stone your child if he disrespects you. and And you look at that and you think, well, that's written in 
it's a book of Jewish law. And so you're looking at this ancient Middle Eastern culture and they've written down all their laws. Now, why you would follow that law as opposed to, you know, Egyptian law from 3,000 years ago, what's the difference? It's just that this happens to be in your holy book. And so this is where where the way I talk starts to sound a bit heretical. And, and I think you have to view it. And, 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 and You are a heretic. Yes. I'm an absolute heretic. And I had this realization like about a week ago. No. What, that you're a heretic? In terms of Christian circles, yeah. Like, I believe in Christianity. And I actually, it's only this year I've realized I believe in God. But I've been going to church and I listen to what they're saying and I'm like... No, I don't agree. With the interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm a heretic. I'm not orthodox. You're a reformist. I don't know what I am. (laughs) I don't know what I am. All right. But but I think it's... Let's wrap this up. All right, let's wrap it up. And so I just want to conclude by... Yeah, like, I, I think I've learned something and listening to your... Like, to me, that was such an interesting story that you told how when you were 19... You had to go and read these works of literature and read these classics and, and there were things which you didn't even know the meaning of, but you worked it out and there's this real sort of like homegrown uh, like philosophy from the ground up that you've built and you've got a document uh, outlining the way, you, the way you move and navigate through life. And to me, that was fascinating because I grew up in a context where I was told from such a young age, this is right and this is wrong and this has ultimate and eternal consequences. So, mm. And I'm almost envious when you describe that, that um, that y- you've had this experience where there was almost, uh, obviously you had right and wrong, but there was there was almost like a vacuum or, or, or like an emptiness. Yeah, like a blank slate that you could work yeah, and, yeah, and you could figure it out and, and you could come to it with an, a more open mind than what I was ever able to do. Mm. Um, and so to me um, I guess I want to finish with something like like to me it all comes down to this whole idea that humans are made in the image of God that if Christianity is true and there's a God then what that means is that every human being has infinite worth and every human being is this strange combination of a fragile creature subject to mortal constraints and it's easily broken and killed but at the same time there's this aspect of the divine this aspect of infinity in the form of our consciousness and i think you can feel this like you sort of get intimations of this in sort of like in a in a work of great art like a you know when you see these photos of these like children like children in africa or in india they're in some refugee camp or something and and you see like the photo of like a three-year-old boy like playing or something and and it is so innocent and free in the midst of suffering and it's sort of like something about that that rings true that something about human life is valuable and it it is it is worth something And, and i think that gets lost in all the arguments and and so like this idea that we're mortal and that somehow infinity itself is coming through us in the form of our consciousness i can't i can't get rid of it and so to me like if christianity is about anything then that idea has to has to hold true and it and and so when i see religious people and they're arguing about this or that or the or they're saying or, or just the way they're acting, it's it's they're sort of putting their own tribe first, or like putting yeah putting their dogma before and their ego. Absolutely, um, and which is why, like, to me, there's not a tension between psychedelics and your experience of the divine, which is not a mainstream Christian position. Mm-hmm. And yet, I guess that's all I've got to say. So if you want to say a few words to wrap up... and I'm just call, hoping the call it night. inquisitors don't bash down the <laughs> door and hang us up. No, that's all. That was good. Good chat. I enjoyed it. No, thank you. Podcast number one. Boom. Cheers, Voss.